Hi, and welcome back. I got a question from a viewer about the guitar sound in my song, Maybe. It was so glowingly complimentary that I decided to answer with a video. Plus, of course, it's a perfect excuse to plug my Waves affiliate link, which I keep forgetting to do. Because, spoiler alert, most of the guitar sounds in this song come from their new voltage amps. In fact, the song was kind of inspired by them and sort of fell out of me while I was trying the amps for the first time. So the voltage amps were used for both clean parts at the start, the glitchy strat lead about halfway through, and the double-tracked main riff that the question referred to. I did, however, use one of my usual saved track templates for the Les Paul lead part at the end. I was in the swing of creation by then and didn't want to waste time dialing in a tone from scratch. Anyway, the fact that I was trying those amp models for the first time has a little unexpected bonus. It means I wasn't using my custom modified tube preamp for any of the distortion, as I often do. Nor did I have any overdrive or distortion pedals in front of the DI. I did actually go in through the preamp, but using the clean channel, which is solid state and sounds exactly as clean and neutral as an active DI box. So the first of those parts, completely raw, sounds like this. That's how the bridge pickup of a Les Paul sounds when it's not running through a screaming amp. Kind of hilarious, right? The first plug-in in the chain is actually a noise gate, FabFilter Pro-G running the guitar style. It sounds too extreme and a bit unnatural with the guitar soloed like this. But that feeling disappears completely in context with the mix, and it's much more powerful overall, with tighter gaps in the guitar parts. The next plug-in on that channel is actually bypassed for the section the question referred to, so I'm going to skip it for now and come back to that later. Next up, the amp. I'm using the Silverado amp model on the lead channel, and I've picked speaker cab number four. Five different amp models, each with multiple channels, plus a choice of cabinet, means a really wide range of guitar sounds are available, and I haven't got close to exploring them all yet. I'm going to just quickly highlight two parameters of note. I found the focus knob surprisingly useful when dialing in my tone. And the room ambience available in the bottom section is very well done. It adds a convincing sense of space and depth without colouring the basic tone and also gets my seal of approval. That's actually the last plug-in on this channel. It's far from the end of the story, as there's quite a lot of bus processing to talk about. But first I need to introduce you to the other doubled guitar part. It's an SG this time, with a P90 bridge pickup. It's running through another gate, same deal as for the Les Paul part, and another instance of the mystery plug-in that's currently in bypass. And then the amp, arena model this time, on the lead channel using cab number three. This one also has an EQ after it, Q3 with some high and low pass filters, and a bit of shaping in the mid and upper mid range. Okay, let's move on to the bus. This is a Reaper folder containing just those two guitar parts, so I'm now processing them both together. However, note that the two parts are currently just hard panned left and right, which means the first effect on the channel, Saturn II running the warm tube style, is really, in effect, a dual mono process. I'm saturating each guitar individually here, using the left-right stereo mode rather than mid and side, they're not intermodulating one another at all. But doing this on the bus means I can easily add the same little bit of extra harmonic spiciness to both parts in one go. Next up, Volcano 3 with some saturating high and low pass filters, both of which are driven pretty hard. These make a really important difference in my opinion, but I highlighted that in the video that prompted the original question, so I'll pop a link to that video down below and move on. Proceed to compression. Nothing too extreme, 
just tightening up both parts a little. Notice, however, that I've unlinked the stereo channels, so we've again got separate dual mono processes. Each guitar is being compressed independently, but I can conveniently dial in both at the same time. Next up, EQ. We're getting a bit more serious now. This instance of ProQ3 is really significant. But there's actually kind of two separate things going on here. Often when I mix, I will separate these two things and use two instances of the EQ. Not because it makes any difference to the sound, but just so I can easily bypass each individually. For some reason, I didn't this time. But the video will be clearer if I do so belatedly. So let's start with just these five bands, which are all running in stereo. High pass filter, just because. It cleans up that zero hertz stuff that's a consequence of the asymmetric tube saturation earlier in the chain, but which probably doesn't matter anyway. Okay, now two boosts. Either I wanted those guitars to sound fatter, or I thought there was a bit of a hole in the mix in that region that the guitars should fill. Both kind of true, really. And I'm still agreeing with that choice now. But the 250Hz cut became necessary when I boosted the lows and the low mids to stop it getting too tubby. Let's temporarily boost that frequency instead. That's the part of the sound I wanted less of. Let's skip over this sharp cut for the moment and talk about this milder one at 2K. It's a region you have to be very careful with when it comes to distorted guitars. It can easily get harsh and abrasive in this region, and I will often cut around here. But if you take away too much of this region, the guitar will sound dull and muffled. Often I will balance a gentle cut around 2K or 2K5 with a boost higher up, usually somewhere between 6 and 8K, to replace the sense of brightness in a less harsh and painful way. But in this case, I seem to have done all of that elsewhere, mostly with the slightly resonant low-pass filter in Volcano 3 that I showed you earlier. Okay, now the big one. A whole 10 dB of cut at 1.2 kHz. This is a critically important region for electric guitars, and actually, normally, I'm more likely to boost here than cut. But that's one of the reasons I've cut this frequency instead. There's a lot of this in the lead guitar part that comes in later. It's crucially important to that sound, and the parts fit together much better with this cut in place. The other reason, I just think it suits the part better with that slightly scooped mid-range. It sounds more powerful and focused to me. I say slightly scooped, even though 10 dB is rather a lot, because I've kept the cut pretty narrow. And I think that's generally a good strategy when scooping guitar sounds. The mid-range is where all the magic lives, so a narrower scoop can give you that powerful kind of sound without killing the mid-range entirely. Okay, let's move on to the other instance of Pro Q3, which is just doing the mid-side part of my original processing. I'm boosting some mid and upper mid frequencies in the mid channel, and cutting the same or similar frequencies in the sides channel. This is for two reasons. First, mono compatibility. Here are those two parts in mono without the EQ. They sound dull and muffled. They don't have the right kind of presence that the part needs. But with the EQ switched in, we're literally only hearing those two boosts in mono, so the mono sound is fixed. Great. But this setup is literally narrowing the stereo image when we listen in stereo, right? The guitars won't be perfectly hard panned anymore after this processing. And don't we want them nice and wide? Well, let's listen in stereo and toggle bypass again. I don't really hear it as a narrowing of the image, personally. The low mid-range stays nice and wide, which gives us the feeling of width and space that we're after. 
but I perceive the narrowing of the mids and upper mids as just creating a more solid and focused centre image. Next up, Timeless 3. Quite a subtle setting this. Let me turn it up so you can hear what it's doing. Notice I've band limited this quite severely with the high and especially the low pass filter so it doesn't take up too much space in the mix. And I've mixed it in very gently like so. So you don't really notice it at all. It just stops the parts sounding quite so two dimensional. Okay, last thing on the bus is an instance of Yuhei Satin. Another subtle one. It's adding a little bit of spice at the top end and maybe tightening up the bottom a bit as well. This seems a good time to mention the mystery plugin that was in Bypass earlier, because actually, initially, it was loaded here on this guitar bus. It's the Time Shaper module in Shaperbox 3, with the patterns being switched via MIDI notes. But while I liked what this was doing, I didn't like the munchkin effect when the guitars were pitched higher. So this instance got bypassed, and instead I ran copies of it before the amp sims on both guitar channels, and I thought that sounded a lot better. Have we finished now? Maybe. Not really though. There's more bus processing to talk about. That guitar subgroup we've been processing is actually inside another subgroup which also contains the lead guitar part at the end. There's only one plug-in here, a Waves Kramer Pi compressor. It's actually barely doing anything. I think I probably dialed in more compression than this initially, but further changes like compression or saturation on the individual channels have rendered it almost redundant. Nevertheless, it does help to gently push the rhythm guitars behind the lead part when it comes in, and is probably still helping a tiny bit. OK, onto the mix bus. First up, FabFilter Pro MB. It's tightening up the lows and controlling the highs a bit. Notice the 6 dB scale at the top. This processing is subtler than it looks. Next up, the Waves Puig Child 670. Never really sure how to pronounce that name. Anyway, hilariously, this doesn't seem to be doing any compression at all. I'm pretty sure it was when I first dialed it in, but much like with the Pi compressor, subsequent changes to the mix feeding it appear to have eaten all the peaks that were hitting the threshold and now the gain reduction meters aren't moving at all. This kind of thing can often happen when you take a more top-down approach to mixing, and it's not really a problem as long as the mix sounds good. That doesn't mean the plugin isn't doing anything, however. First of all, vintage-style gain reduction meters aren't always to be trusted, and sometimes there's significant compression happening before they start to move at all. But more importantly in this case, this plugin has a box tone that I often find helpful, and I often load it just for that. I assume there's some gentle saturation going on, but I haven't bothered to analyse it yet. It sounds good to me, so I use it. Notice how it subtly brightens the high frequencies while gently tightening up the lows. Is this a good time to mention the Waves affiliate links down below? Assuming I managed to remember how to do it, of course. Next, Pulsar Massive. You can see what it's doing, though notice the 3 dB scale for the EQ graph. This is subtle. The little extra touch of spice I added by driving it hard is perhaps more significant than the EQ itself here. Next, FabFilter Pro C2. Subtle again, barely more than 1 dB of gain reduction, with a ratio of 1.5 to 1 using the mastering style. I find this kind of setting can add a nice extra density and weight to a mix while still somehow sounding like exactly the same mix. This algorithm just refuses to damage it in any way. Finally, another instance of satin. It's a relatively hi-fi and clean setting, 
30 yips with the modern tape style and the Dolby A type companding and it gives us a slightly glossier, shinier finish. It's subtle again. Some of you might be wondering why I bother with such tiny and seemingly insignificant differences. I can answer that by bypassing the entire mix bus chain together. Those little insignificant differences add up to make a fairly obvious and significant difference. So I will defend our right as audio engineers to care about them. Okay, that's about it. There was a separate mastering stage, of course, but I rarely do much more than limiting when I master my own mixes, as I've already mixed it to sound how I want it, and I don't have any new insights as a separate mastering engineer might. So I'll leave it there. Don't forget to check down below for those Waves affiliate links in case you want some of those lovely amp tones or a bus compressor that still sounds good even when it's not compressing. And thanks for watching. <laughs>